Hello everyone, this is Maz. If you're hearing this message, it means you're not part of the Voices of War subscriber community and will only hear the first half of the episode. If that's enough, then I'm thrilled. However, if you're looking to dive deeper into the complexities of war, please consider subscribing to our private feed by using the link at the top of the show notes. By doing so, you'll gain access to all of our episodes, the ability to ask follow-up questions, and we'll become part of an exclusive community that makes this show possible. I hope you'll make the decision to join us today. It shows the insidiousness of the Nazi regime as they really started from elementary school to manipulate the minds of the children, to indoctrinate them into becoming really um, thoughtless followers. And while he saw many of his comrades being killed by, by the tanks and by the oncoming army, he was able to destroy four tanks, but saw immediately that the wall of tanks continued to come. He was extremely angry and depressed when he realized what had happened. He felt violated, right? He felt that he had been made to participate in something that he clearly was unaware of, would have been unwilling to do, and was an unwitting participant, but he was made to be complicit. And then it becomes a rule of fear and intimidation, and then you, you can't speak up, because if you do, you, you will probably not survive, or your family will be hurt. My guest today is Heidi Langbein Allen, who is a first-time author and who recently published the memoirs of her father, Willy Langbein, who at the age of 13 was forced to fight for the Nazis. The book is called Save the Last Bullet, Memoir of a Boy Soldier in Hitler's Army. I recently finished the book and have found it to be very raw and graphic as it vividly depicts the use of propaganda and misinformation to give moral weight to an otherwise losing and abhorrent cause. It is also a story of lost innocence and despair in the face of circumstances beyond the control of fully grown adults, let alone children and teenagers. With all that said, as we will find out, it is also a story of determination, resilience and hope, nurtured in the ruins of post-war Germany. Heidi joins me today to discuss the lessons we can draw from her father's experiences of the Second World War and how that war impacted her father's life as well as her own. Heidi, thank you very much for joining me on The Voices of War and uh, herzlich willkommen. Uh, vielen, vielen Dank. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, on your show. I'm, I'm really excited to be part of it today. Thank you very much. And uh, just before we dig into the book, which I recently finished, and uh, wow, what a read. Uh, firstly, I can't believe you're a first-time author. I like, just couldn't believe it because the book is written so well and vividly. And um, my heart rate was going up and down as I was reading it because... Uh, it is so alive. So firstly, congratulations on that. That's a r- great effort. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And now I have the bug. So uh, I'm already working on the second one, which is uh, actually an anthology of war stories of young people at the end of World War II. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. That sounds uh, absolutely interesting as well. And, uh, and, and as, we maybe, uh, as we close out, there's definitely something I'd, uh, I'd like to address. Uh, but before we get to, I guess, this book that, that we're talking about today, um, I mean, as I alluded to in the intro, you are not originally an author. So how and why did you come uh, to write this book? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I never I never fathomed that I would ever write a book uh, and then set out to write a book. I uh, did, however, bug my father for many years to um, to record his his memoirs uh, because I thought that they were relevant. They were a historical account that were important. Even then, I could sense it when I was relatively young, and continued to to ask him. Uh, but he he really, you know, didn't want to talk about it because mm. you know, of course, he had PTSD, and these are very painful memories. Mm. Mm. In particular, for World War II veterans, I think uh, on the losing side of the war, in mm. particular mm. for Germany, mm. yeah. uh, because of that, you know, collective guilt and of uh, just uh, the mandate that he that he received. Uh, no. As soon as the war ended, he was told never to speak of it again. And so he carried that with him for many, many years. Um, uh, and finally, he relented when he was in his 70s, you know, after he had retired. I think he just started to sort of you know, perhaps reminiscing on his life mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and realizing that, that, uh, that, yes, that it was important enough to put this, uh, this story down, um, mm-hmm. you know, on record. 
uh, and then and then I still obviously didn't think about writing anything other than having that account for my family, right? And so mm. Ed, Ed, I I listened to the tapes in fascination. He he put together sixteen audio cassette tapes. That's how wow, yeah, <laughs> that's how wow, old it was wow, and yeah. um, and and managed to get them onto CDs. And then I listened to them, and my sister listened, and we were fascinated. And I put the tapes away for like nine years, and then uh, and then realized um, in twenty sixteen. That um, that my father was getting older, and he was very getting very, very concerned about the the ge- geopolitical events unfolding, the the uh, the increase of of um, you know neo Nazism and just extreme movements, uh, extreme right, far right movements uh, around the world, and um, that compelled me to uh, to pull out those tapes, and I set out to translate them to my family. Because mm-hmm. I wanted my kids who don't speak German and my mm-hmm. husband who doesn't speak German to to read it and to understand that history. And mm-hmm. that then evolved into actually a friend of mine who's a writer saying, oh, no, 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 this is a book. There's a book, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was crazy, but you know, he, <laughs> he struck a chord. He struck a chord. Mm-hmm. He was right. Uh, and and I realized the importance of it. And, and it made me also, I think, it energized me. Uh, because I thought perhaps that is a small contribution that I can make yeah, uh, toward yeah. the preserving of democracy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what I loved about the book in particular, it was written in first person, so it was written as though your father was writing it, yeah. which to me was so incredible because even in, in the early stages, the, the, you know, the questions of a child kept popping up. Uh, the, the, the attitudes of a child were present. The competitiveness of a child, the trust of a child was so deeply embedded in the words that you were writing, uh, which for me was a really, that was a really powerful side of the book. Uh, but I want to I wanna ask you, when you first listened to the tapes, because you listened to them in first person, how was it for you, firstly, as somebody who's well aware of what had happened in that war, but also as the daughter of the person dictating, I guess, the story? Yeah, you know, it, it was very, it was very emotional. Uh, mm. And it was um, you because you know, didn't know much of this, I'd imagine, right? I mean, because you said it was I you didn't talk some, about it much. You know, and yeah, he had, yeah, he yeah. Had given me enough snippets that I mm. knew mm-hmm. that the story was incredibly important. Mm. I mean, just for him to have participated yeah. at that age, mm. at the very end of the war, uh, was was uh, it was appalling, right? It, it was just it was something that I felt needed to be shared with you know, with present and future generations mm, to, mm. to perhaps, you know, I mean, encourage some type of thought or reflection, yeah, yeah, you know, about yeah. about the horrors of, of something yeah. like that happening again. And which how one sleeps is yeah. is happening, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and how nations right? can sleepwalk into it. I think that's the yeah. that's the you know that's the message that really resonated with me because uh as as we'll come to talk about it, he wasn't aware uh well until the very end or even after the war of the uh, of what was ultimately done in his name and the name of the German people, uh, which exactly. is, is is a huge part of that story. Uh, but uh, you also have a little bit of a link uh, to the military because I believe your husband is former U.S. Navy. How did he react when he heard, firstly, when he found out the story that uh, your father was an active, active uh, I don't want to say serviceman because he wasn't a man, but he was an active uh, service child uh, um, in in in... World War Two on the other side, uh, but also when he heard the story, I mean, because to him obviously he would have spoken with different tones, I guess. Yeah, and so you know, it's interesting, right? Because you know, I well met my husband, who was you know an American right? when mm. he was an American soldier. When I met him, he was already in the Navy. He's now mm. retired um, uh, in Europe. I mean, he was stationed in Europe, and he was um, on a holiday, right? <laughs> I was I was on holiday and in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, minding my own business, but uh, so mm-hmm. we were very young. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, I think it was a bit intimidated by my, my dad and his history, you know, especially being, you know, that he was, you know, quote unquote, a Nazi soldier, even though mm. he, you know, I explained to him, well, he was 13. Mm. Um, so he, he, and then he felt, I think, compassion in a way, right? Because mm. he, did, well, he's a serviceman, he was. And he was, um, he actually went to the Persian Gulf War. Uh, so he, he's a veteran right. himself with foreign wars. And, uh, and I think he understood and he was fascinated really by it. 
And my father, on the other hand, was it was really funny because he, <laughs> he uh, the the only thing that that he uh, that he basically criticized was, wow, did it have to be an American soldier, really? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> an army. Because he, yeah. he was taken prisoner. He was yeah, taken prisoner by the course. Americans, of course. So, yeah, yeah, of course. Oh wow, wow. But, but they the, got along uh, just just famously, though, actually, until the, my dad's uh, passing away. Passing, yeah. I mean, it would have uh, certainly been the bane of uh, many a joke uh, over the years, yeah, undoubtedly right. internally. Um, okay, so we've kind of danced around the topic of the book, but it's probably important for the audience to actually get an understanding, at least in wave tops, what is the book about. And what does it try to address? So the book, in in a, in its, uh, in its narrowest sense, is is the story of my father as told by himself in those tapes. Mm. So I basically, ghost wrote it uh, for him um, mm. uh, about his story of being a, a young boy conscripted into a war that uh, that he had. It, no choice, of course, in joining and or any any type of control over uh, or really any knowledge of. And so it shows the insidiousness of the Nazi regime as they really started from, a, you know, from from elementary school on mm. to 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 manipulate the minds of the children, mm. to indoctrinate them into becoming really um you know, thoughtless followers, right? To eliminate mm. really any notion of free will, to make them into a questioningly accepting authority. Mm. That that was really the the aim, the goal of, of the Nazi regime and this uh, in the indoctrination of, of young children into a regime. And that is actually a playbook that that mm. is repeated everywhere uh, in the world in autocratic regimes. And um, we, we actually see it unfolding today, right? In places like Russia, mm. with children mm. already being... You know, uh, provided with paramilitary training and and was uh, you know propaganda really right mm, a massive mm. propaganda. And, and when what? How was that in his case? I mean, again, most of us know of World War Two and you know the propaganda writ large uh, of the Nazi regime, uh, but I don't think it's very often discussed how that permeated down into, as you say, elementary school. What did that look like for your father? What was he exposed to? What was the information diet, I guess, that he was exposed to growing up? Well, it's very interesting. You know, they they started changing the the textbooks in school, hmm. and hmm. so the narrative changed from things like, you know, um, exalting family and and church, hmm. to exalting you know blood and fatherland. Right? Hmm. Words is words starting getting changed. It's literally all in semantics, right? Yeah. But it, it just started. Words uh, matter, it right started now. weaving those in, and then the glorification of the Nazi regime in children's stories, right? Mm. Where they had, you know, mom sewing uh, the SS uniform of dad while dad was extolling the virtues of the fur, right? And the Hitler, as the fur was was um, portrayed as basically the savior of humanity, right? And not the mm. German. Uh, and that everybody owed him ultimate allegiance because he was um, basically, for the children, it, he was portrayed as the creator and the protector of everything mm. and the holder of the ultimate truth. Basically. Yeah. And so this goes on. And it, so, you know, and we know that from psychology, right? Uh, people, human beings form beliefs that are very, very deep seated in childhood, in early mm. childhood. Mm. And so these beliefs then become so ingrained in the psyche that they're almost impossible to change, right? Yeah. And that that was that was really the the goal, right? That was the the objective. And so they started, you know, with the you know grade school books, and then enrolled the children, the the male children, female children also had their own organizations, but they mm. they enrolled male children at age ten in an organization called the Jungfolk, which was the precursor to the. Hitler Jugend, with the mm, Hitler youth mm, that mm, people mm. are more familiar with, but there was this uh, this in between sort of uh, like uh, you know like with the Boy Scouts, you know you've got the younger mm -hmm. uh, you know cohorts, uh, cohorts kind of and yeah. then the, mm -hmm. yeah so same it was a similar concept right and it was actually loosely um, inspired by by those organizations youth organizations that existed before the Nazi regime mm -hmm. and the Nazi regime just took them over. Right? And so in those in those four years from 10 to 14, they were in the Jungfolk. 
And then boys age 14 to 18 went into the Hitler Youth. And then in the war years, they were conscripted immediately at mm-hmm. age 18 into, into one of the uh, armed uh, forces uh, mm-hmm. branches, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so by the time my father turned nine, uh, the young folk affiliation was no longer voluntary, if it ever mm-hmm. had been. It certainly wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, in 1939, it became mandatory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my father was automatically enrolled. And they learned games that were, you know, portrayed as as fun outdoor games. But mm. in reality, what they were doing is teaching them how to shoot, teaching them how to, how to throw hand grenades. And so to perfect their aim, <laughs> uh, to march, to sing military mm. songs, you know, yeah. all in good fun, but clearly yeah. with a very, very, uh, you know, obscure purpose, right? Well, for boys of that age, I mean, I just think of myself at that age, I mean, you know, but all I wanted to do was be a soldier at the age of, you know, 10 onwards. And even before that, I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah. that's just, you know, and to then have, you know, have the opportunity to, to practice how to shoot and throw grenades. I mean, it all feels so real, uh, which is, uh, and it's so insidious because it's so incremental because, you know, a lot of these organizations like the scouts, et cetera, they have many good qualities that we want children to, you know, enjoy the nature, learn about teamwork, gain independence, self-confidence, et cetera, which is some of these kind of traits that these organizations try to inculcate in children. But then as you slowly weave in, and I found it particularly interesting when we're talking about the books and the history, how incrementally that changes. And that just I can just reflect on on, on my own experience from Bosnia, uh, you know, post-war Bosnia, how the three warring sides started publishing their own books, uh, history mm-hmm. books, and then history of the war, of that particular war. And it starts already planting the seed amongst the new generation ultimately of the next war, right? It, 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 it's because everybody's the good guy. In their own narratives, everybody is the good guy. Uh, and it is the other guys that are the bad ones, the ones that are the cause of all your suffering. And I guess that's absolutely what Hitler capitalized on uh, during those years. But how was it for your father's parents? Because they, and, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, they've observed some of these changes. But as almost as an individual, you're almost silenced when the entire system, when it's a structural, systematic change of the narrative. How do they feel about it? Yeah, and you know, the, and that's a very, it's a difficult question to answer mm. because that is, it, it, in essence, the, this uh, sort of question that we often ask ourselves, how could this mm. have happened? Yeah. And yeah. how could, ra- like you put it, the, you know, rational people, right, adults, mm. uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, fall into this. And and I think you said that, you know, folks kind of sleepwalk into it. And I mm. think that's exactly mm. what's happening. And, and uh, people, I think people ask me this question less now than they did before. And I believe it's because now we can see it and we can mm. see it unfolding even in this country, yeah. right? Yeah. So so there is a, and not necessarily, you know, in this country, although we are seeing extreme mm. movements here too and polarization. Mm. Um, and and so there, there can easily ensue an erosion, a gradual erosion of civil liberties and civil mm. rights that mm. is almost unnoticeable. Mm. And it is all, um, you know, basically packaged up in... In a way where, you know, it's it's couched as being to the benefit of the people or for mm-hmm. the benefit yeah. of the people. Yeah. It's, you know, for their safety or for their well-being or what, whatever the reason might be, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then the narrative is typically, um, you know, there's some common themes, right? There's a, there is an enemy image, right? And ju- just pick your minority. Mm, that's right. Day, yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Color, yeah. creed, yeah. whatnot. Um, and and then you you throw on top of that uh, a good dose of telling people what they want to hear, mm. you know, uh, just appeal to their fears and to their worries, and and tell them you're going to fix it. Mm. Mm. And that's yeah. the recipe. I mean, it's you know, it's it's of incredibly simplified, but I mean, those yeah. are kind of the basic elements, and that's exactly what happened. Or you had a depressed country. It was coming out of losing one world war with impossible reparation terms, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, huge unemployment. I mean, it's was, it was devastating depression. I think it was like, uh, was it uh, over half of the male population mm-hmm. of working age was actually unemployed? 
uh, and people uh, were destitute. And so here Mm. comes a man who tells them that he's going to fix all of that and that none of it is 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 really anybody's fault but the the, the bad mm. people which in this case were the Jews right mm. and that and it's their fault and and I'm going to fix it for you mm. and everything's going to be fine and so people want so desperately to believe things like that mm. that I think that is a major contributor to them then overlooking all of the other small flaws that they might actually observe but they don't do anything about it yeah yeah. And then there's also that, you know, uh, passive attitude that really most civilians have where they think, well, it's, right. it's going to blow over, it's going to go away, it'll pass, you know, mm. it's, it's okay. Yeah. And yeah. then it's too late, right? When you yeah. finally figure it out, it's too late. And then you, yeah. you're trapped, right? Then the person's trapped and they can't get out, um, even if they wanted to, probably. Yeah. I mean, it's scary, right? I mean, especially if they promised yeah. to drain the swamp as a, as a recent example. Drain um, the swamp, yes. Well, as, as you know, and this is, this is, I mean, the absolute textbook. Uh, but, but also, again, if I just think back to, to Bosnia, there was absolutely the narrative. It was always the other guy. It was the other guy that was uh, whose fault it was that you had nothing, that everything was taken from you. Exactly. You know, the, it's always an external enemy uh, that you can blame, which then, of course, justifies, moralizes any actions that are carried on from there, especially when the entire information domain is geared towards that one purpose as it progressively dehumanizes um, and then as you as you start slipping down that slippery slope it becomes much harder to climb out because you've already come this far it's you know it, it takes admitting that you've that you've you know you've you've gone too far already uh, and that is something very hard to do to admit to yourself that you have now become complicit so therefore you most people double down. Um, to then justify everything that uh, that goes from there. I mean, it's just the again human psychology, right? It, it, a very slippery slope. And then there comes a point, of course, and that happened in Germany, and and it happened, of course, with with the conflict that that you experienced as a mm-hmm. child as well, mm-hmm. where um, then it, then it becomes a rule of fear and intimidation, and then and then you, you can't speak up. Mm. Mm, mm. Because if you do, you, you will probably not survive, or your family yeah. will get hurt. You know? And we also know from you know decades of research, social science research, that obedience matters, that authority matters, uh, that as much as we'd like to think, oh, I would not have participated, or I would have, I would have stood up. Chances are, for 70 percent of those listening, at least that's according to research. Uh, no, we would have just uh, either participated or stood by and done absolutely nothing. And I put myself into this. You know, I'm part of this bell curve as well. Uh, you know, just like anybody else uh, walking on this planet. I think I, uh, yeah, absolutely agree. I think uh, the, the the majority of us really can't know until we are in a situation like that what we would do. And yes, I I agree. I'm sure that at least two thirds or more of people would that would simply keep their head down and try to mm. provide for them. Well, in, per- in particular also because the threat is not one to oneself only, but typically it's extended to one's family, right? Yeah, to right. make yeah. the threat more, more real. Yeah, yeah, and salient for those that, that, yeah, yeah. Well, we see that in Russia today. If you, if you dare to speak up against the state at all, I think now it's 15 years jail, uh, but we all know what that means, uh, certainly in the Russian context, uh, you know, especially now that they're recruiting from the jails. Either you're going to die in a jail or you're going to die on a battlefield because you've been <laughs> thrown into a trench with uh, hardly any training uh, as, uh, as cannon fodder, which I think, uh, again, is, uh, is rather reflective of your father's experience, uh, which, uh, uh, again, we wouldn't get to. But uh, I'm just interested, at the start, you said that your father got inspired as he was watching geopolitical events turn uh, around the kind of, uh, well, I think you said 2015, 2016. Was there something in particular that he saw, that he observed, that triggered him? Um, was it in Germany? Because was he in Germany at that time, or, or where in did Spain. he? Spain, oh, actually, he was in retired. Spain. Okay. Yeah, in Spain, my mother is is a Spaniard, and and so right. they were um, they retired in uh, Valencia, Spain. In okay, yeah, um, lovely. He, although he did visit, of course, Germany, mm, but mm-hmm. um, he it was just the the general. So you know, and maybe just kind of spoiler alert on the on the on the story, but. You know, as he was, as he luckily uh, survived the war, um, and survived also his subsequent depression and regained hope. 
he determined to dedicate his life to ensuring that he would do whatever mm. he could mm. to not have that repeat itself under mm. under his basically his watch, right? Yeah. And yeah. so he, uh, you know, he worked his whole life toward that goal. He actually did. He became a lawyer, uh, worked for uh, the German Department of Defense his entire career. Mm. He was in the Foreign Service. Um, he ended his career as the head of a uh, NATO legal division mm. in uh, Germany, in Munich. Incredible, yeah. And he uh, he actually wrote the, he authored the Tornado contract. The Tornado mm. is the NATO fighter aircraft yeah. that is yeah, just yeah. now being decommissioned. Um, mm. And he, he actually earned the Medal of European Merit for the advancement of democracy in Europe. Wow. wow. So he really wow, wow. did dedicate his life to democracy to the advancement and the defense of democracy. And he saw, you know, events unfolding and accelerating, right? I mean, these mm. started way before 2016, I would say arguably even before mm. 2010 mm. already. Mm. Mm. But mm. but they started really accelerating. And in 2016, they became very obvious. Mm. Um, mm. And that's when he kind of sounded the alarm. He says, I'm, I'm extremely worried about what, what is going on in the world and that that everything I have worked for, I, I've dedicated my entire life uh, to, is is not in jeopardy and right? is in danger. Mm, mm, yeah, and what yeah. motivation he had, I guess, is just it's just incredible. Uh, and that's what I want to get to next. I mean, there, there's obviously a furnace burning inside of him. Uh, uh, I guess to, in a way, uh, probably cleanse uh, some of that guilt that he had, but also because with his own eyes he saw the absolute horrors uh, of war, both on an interpersonal level, but also on a macro society level um yes. so so maybe we can uh, delve into some components of, of of firstly how did the war start for him uh and then what was his war and his combat experience uh like yeah that's that's a very good uh question and i i think the war and really, even though he didn't know it the war started for him when they took him away right when mm. the nazis came and took him away uh, from his parents at age 13 to, mm. you know, under the guise of protection against mm. Allied bombing. You know, yeah. they had that program called uh, the Kinderlandverschickung, which was so mm. loosely, you could translate into the, you know, children's relocation program. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and it was intended really to actually uh, not to protect the children. It was, it was to separate them from the influence of their parents and the church and to further indoctrinate them and to provide them with military and or paramilitary training. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, and they succeeded, of course. And so once he was taken away, he, you know, he lost contact with his parents, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pretty much completely. I mean, he, he did have that one episode, Christmas uh, 1943, yeah. where he escaped, actually, and, um, and, and saw his parents. But that was the last time he saw them until, you know, until the wars or after mm -hmm. the wars. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when it really started, even whether he knew it or not. Um, yeah. And then soon thereafter, as as the war was, you know, of course, events were deteriorating. Um, they got moved from the city that that they had been placed in, which was on the border with uh, with uh, Switzerland, mm -hmm. the city of Constance. They then moved them to a remote village in the Alps, uh, close to Austria. Whereupon, then uh, he was actually specifically selected because he was uh, tall. And big and strong, mm. and you know, but he was a fourteen-year-old boy, yeah, child, and yeah. he was given two months of military training, and then actually called to to go to the front at the very end. Of war when you war. say he was selected, well, what do you mean he was selected? So they went to the so the SS showed up in the classrooms uh, at this mountain village, and this we're talking forty-four already, mm. um, toward the end of the forty-four, and they. Uh, it, 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 I don't have the exact times in my mm, head right mm. now, but or yeah, more yeah. or less. Um, and the SS showed up in this compound. Um, the children were actually under the supervision of an of a of a Nazi handler the entire time. So from the point in 1943, in the summer of 43, when they were taken away, they were always under the supervision of a Nazi handler. Mm. They had taken the whole class of kids uh, together with the teachers. Mm. To, you know, to still continue, you know, some type of education. But there was a Nazi hammer there at all times to make sure that, you know, the teachers 
didn't go out of line and said what they needed to say. Um, and then the the uh, SS showed up in at the end of forty four and actually selected uh, boys who looked strong enough. And um, they didn't care. The kids were fourteen years old. They knew the kids were fourteen years old. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, and they picked them out specifically. They actually picked only three, the the tallest and biggest. And my father mm-hmm. was one of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, and they selected them to actually get. It conscripted into one of the armed forces and put in 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 combat, mm-hmm. and uh, and that happened in March of 1945. And this is to 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 be part of the well at that point in time certainly the elite SS, right? Is to well they gave them a choice, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the the entire military apparatus was in such disarray that they desperately needed folks at the front. So they gave them a choice whether they wanted to uh, join the SS, the elite force, and with promises of food and mm, seeing their mm. parents, um, because of course everybody was starving. I mean, there was no food. Uh, my father was, you know, uh, always he remembers being always hungry. Everybody, mm. uh, everybody was uh, was really undernourished. Yeah. Um, the the other option was to go to the Wehrmacht, which is the regular army, because mm. they so desperately needed. Uh, people, mm. and so that's how we ended up at um, in at the end of March, in a battle that was actually famous. Um, but he didn't; he never knew it until much, mm. much later. Until much later, Which and I want to get to that battle in a second. Yeah. But I'm just keen yeah. to keen to double click on why he ended up going for the Wehrmacht rather than well yeah. the elite SS. Oh, because the SS well was very creepy, and mm. that didn't get lost on on anybody. And and he witnessed the SS execute one of his classmates right in front of him, right? Mm. Um, because they that that boy had dared steal some butter and some ham from the mm. depot. Yeah, and that's a and and uh, let me talk about collective punishment. I mean, uh maybe describe that scene because I think that's again another powerful scene of the again the the indoctrination and the forced submission to authority and the unquestioning loyalty to the cause. Or yeah, sacrifice I mean, it, to the cause. Yeah, it was a brutal regime. Right? It, it was yeah. a, a regime of, of fear and intimidation, and the uh, the Nazis were extremely swift in in their punishments and mm. um, and very. Um, they they made they made an example, like I said, they made an example out of this boy's uh, having stolen some food mm. uh, to to show the resolve of the Nazi regime and how. Um, you know, misconduct was not going to be tolerated, and the mm. the the you know the the worst punishment was going to be meted out to people who would dare disobey in any mm. way. Mm. Yeah, and it was a if I remember correctly, it was a firing squad with everybody. You know, the the, the rest of the boys forced to watch at least, or at least the young and the the teacher managed to convince the SS to at least let the youngest uh, go away. But I think it was something it was thirteen and above. Everybody was forced to watch the. I guess the execution by firing squad of their yes, key. Uh, of yes, boy. No, that yeah. was absolutely that was absolutely the the aim of the SS was to instill in these boys absolute obedience uh, mm, and yeah. fear of authority. Uh, and so cool. yes, they made them watch. So the the boy, you know, they were desperately hungry. So the boy just went mm. and swiped some 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 ham and some butter. And the, these kid the kids had been uh, stealing food wherever mm. they could because they mm. were starving. Mm. Mm. Um, and, and he of course didn't realize the consequence. Um, and the poor boy was caught and, um, and then, uh, yes, they, the SS made the other boys watch him being executed and by firing squad. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just to, I mean, this is, this is just unfathomable, uh, but you know, I'm sure it happens elsewhere today, child soldiers, uh, across Africa, et cetera, uh, at even younger ages, uh, are forced to even partake, uh, in, uh, the murder of, of of a P to you know uh, to blood them in a way, uh, but also to share that guilt uh, of the murder mm-hmm. uh, in, in a way. Um, but yeah, that's just I mean, that is, it's just incredible how cruel and ruthless uh, that is, and what kind of scars that must leave on a young child's child's mind. Um, from there, your father then went to the front, uh, and as you said, unbeknownst to him, he was to be in a in a rather famous battle. Um, uh, what what happened? Yeah, so um, 
they got picked up in, uh, on March the 18th. And the reason I know that is because the, um, my father you know, then it relates in his memories that um, the his his town, the town of Witten, uh in the Ruhr Valley, uh, close to mm. Dortmund and Cologne, mm. uh, was bombed in the morning of the 19th of March uh, and raised wow. to the ground. And he never knew that because they were listening to ham radios. They had some communication with the mm. outside world in that village. But since he had been picked up mm. just before, to, to, literally the, the afternoon before, he never knew what had happened mm. in, in you know with his town his until town, yeah. the end of the war. Uh, so he uh, he was taken uh, with his other two comrades to the front, to the eastern front. Right? They made their way to the Eastern Front, which was in Austria, mm. to stave off the advance of the Russian army. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and and there, you know, there was really absolutely no thought that they would make it out alive. Right? And you know, they weren't told this, but you know, there was really um, no intent of of having. Did he feel that as well at the time? It. He didn't know that. He mm. he figured it out pretty quickly once mm, he was mm. in the battle. He realized that this was just even with the weapons he was getting and and the type mm. of battle he was in. He realized I mean the chances were overwhelmingly against them. So they um you know they made it to the Eastern Front and he participated in the Battle of Wiener Neustadt, which was the last battle before the invasion or liberation rather of mm. Vienna by the Russian forces. Right. So uh, it was the either second or third Ukrainian army that actually mm. beat them back, beat the Germans back uh, in that battle of Wiener Neustadt, which was the last battle before before right. they they entered Vienna. And what was that? And, and I think that was his first battle. And that was his first battle. And yeah. what was that like? What happened? Well, it was just uh, been absolutely terrifying. I mean, you know, they were uh, they were um, made to, of course, dig the foxhole mm. um, the, at about you know a man's height mm. uh, to to fit in, and they were outfitted with four Panzerfäuste, which are mm. Mm. Uh, the, the single fire weapons which are yeah, any I guess, weapons, akin yeah. to a bazooka mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. it they only fired once and they were given four <laughs> um and, and that was that and then they had a machine gun and uh and a pistol mm. and they were instructed <clears throat> to keep the last bullet for themselves because the nazi handlers told them that under no circumstances should they be captured by the russians because the russians would torture them before they killed them and mm. that was a fate worse than that Wow. And I guess that's also where the title of the book comes from, but also it's the picture of a boy holding a Panzerfaust, uh, which, which is a really vivid image because it's, it is, a, it, I mean, it, it, it is distinctly a child that's, that's, you know, that's on the cover and save the last bullet really, really stands out. Uh, and I think that's, uh, again, for a child of 14, I mean, to save the last bullet. Uh, and I think in your father's case, he did end up saving his last bullet, uh, as he was told. But uh, I guess to his great fortune uh, and the misfortune of someone else, that bullet ultimately wasn't reserved for him. Is that is that right? That that's correct. He uh, and I don't think he really intended it that way. I don't, you know, I don't know how mm, much mm. thinking goes mm. on, right? In in terms of just its survival mode, I imagine when you're in a battle like that, he was a. a a good marksman, lucky for him. And while he saw many of his comrades being killed by, by the tanks and by the oncoming um, army, you know, the foot soldiers that were behind mm-hmm. him, he, mm-hmm. he was able to uh, destroy four tanks, uh, but saw immediately that the wall of tanks continued to come. So he was going to get mm-hmm. run over just like some of his comrades had been. And, um, and then tried to uh, get out of the foxhole shot all the ammunition he had left um in his machine gun and got left with the pistol that was that mm. was uh that was all he had left and so he ended up with just one bullet um at which point he fell into this into the hand of hand combat where he used it against his aggressor who did manage to very seriously wound him with a bayonet mm. What, what, what do you and, mean? and the and the the other soldier was um, my father recalls that he was a Russian kid, 
<laughs> not much older than he was himself. Yeah. But he had yeah. to make that split second decision and the kid was going to kill him and, and almost managed to and split his leg open, um, you know, from the knee on down uh, and actually hit, I, it looks like he hit an artery. Uh, right. And my father had to shoot him, obviously. Mm, mm. And uh, he also, well, because of his wounds, he barely survived, right? He barely survived. He he was very lucky that uh, a couple of comrades uh, who were fleeing the, the battle uh, grabbed him and were able to tourniquet his leg, uh, just to, I guess, just giving him enough uh, strength mm-hmm. to to mm-hmm. make it out of the the yeah. field and into the back area where the the trucks were and the, and the reinforcements. Um, well, not the reinforcements, actually the rest of the division, whoever was left, was there. Yeah. And yeah. was able to, um, to get to If you'd like to hear the rest of this episode and gain access to all of the episodes of The Voices of War, simply become a subscriber using the link in the show notes. As you know, I will not feature any ads on the show, which is made possible solely through the support of our subscribers. If you find value in the content, you can become one now.